Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you to the college tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, there's a brief announcements period. Then we will have our main speaker who will then speak. After that, we will then have our question and answer period. And you'll all get a chance to uh, hear from our, and then you'll all get a chance to spot off in our rebuttal period. The college has two simple rules. One, one fool at a time. And two, no personal attacks. And tonight, for our speaker is Adam Bali. Tonight, we have the life and ideas of Hungarian economist Janos Kornai. Under communism, on the 30th anniversary of the 1989 fall of the Eastern Bloc, Adam Balling presents a glimpse at 20th century European history, economic ideas and dynamics in recent politics, as well as a surprisingly dramatic life. Hungarian economist James Kornai, who is not a household name but a distinguished academic, who wrote an autobiography by force of thought, irregular memoirs, and an intellectual journey. He was born in 1928, lived through World War II, and lost relatives to the Holocaust. Joining the Communist Party after the war, initially a true believer, Cornet later became a critic of communism through both his study of economics and learning about Stalinist repression. Despite suffering persecution in the aftermath of the 1956 uprising, his ideas about central planning and chronic economic shortages under state socialism won him an audience on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Perhaps unique in being able to reach Soviet bloc experts, as well as scholars in the West, both followers of Keynesianism and more market-oriented opponents, still alive at 91, in recent years, Kornai has spoken out against the Orban regime in Hungary. Let's welcome, with a rousing round of applause, Adam Balling. Yeah. Uh, thank you, all of you. Thank you for coming. Um, I have been to several of these events just in the last uh, not quite two years, uh, thanks to when my friend Justin, sitting over there on the side, first gave a presentation here in March of 2018, I believe. Um, I have been intimidated about giving a presentation here the whole time, so we'll see how I do, especially after being sick for a week and uh, maybe over-preparing and under-delivering at the same time. Um, Tim, thank you for the introduction, which, interests of full disclosure, I wrote out back a while ago. Why don't you introduce your wife and daughter real quick while they're here? Okay, and to appeal to the audience's sympathies, I brought family, my parents, my lovely wife, and my daughter, who is a not yet 14 months old. Four of them, all important people in my life, are sitting here right by the podium. Thank you, Tim. And thanks to all of you. Uh, and any newcomers, just to, I'll remind us that once we get to question and answers, they are really serious about this. The questions are to be questions. And it's really more of an observation that waits for Act 3 when the audience members give rebuttals. Because I know we have some fresh faces here tonight as well. Um, so I sketched out uh, an excessive amount of overly detailed notes, which I probably won't be able to go into in great depth. Uh, and instead, I'd like to make this a little more conversational. Besides the description that Tim read out, had any of you heard of Janos Kornai, this man whose autobiography I read uh, before it was announced for the lecture series here at the College of Complexes? Was this a familiar name to any of you? No. Okay. So he is now, uh, if he lives through next month, I don't know what the current state of his health is, almost 92 years old. And uh, he was born in Budapest in January of 1928. And if any of you know much of anything about Budapest and Hungary between World War I and World War II, 
He was born in an authoritarian right-wing Hungary. Uh, after the end of World War I and the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and its division into a series of successor states, there had been tremendous political upheaval in the years following the war. There was even, around the same time that the Russian Civil War was going on to the east, for about five or six months in 1919, there was a short-lived Hungarian-Soviet Republic, the first communist revolution, uh, which was in a shaky coalition fighting border wars with some of the other successor states from the old Habsburg Empire, uh, like Czechoslovakia, like uh, Romania, beyond its borders to the east. Um, and soon enough, that Soviet government collapsed and an anti-communist government led by an old Austro-Hungarian admiral, Miklos Horty, came to power. I, I hope these, I'll try to keep these stories short if they get too boring, because we're still eight years before his birth or, or so. Um, and over the course of Admiral Horty's career leading Hungary nominally as a regent for a monarchy they never really ended up restoring, It became an increasingly right-wing authoritarian place, first after a wave of terror in 1919 and 1920 when they crushed the left-wing Soviet that had been in power. And then, especially once the Depression hit and through the 1930s, even more so than in the 1920s. Increasingly anti-Semitic, uh, increasingly pro-fascist or pro-Nazi, ultimately allied or joined the Axis later invaded the Soviet Union. And Miklos Horthy would rotate through different prime ministers so you could see the government in Hungary in those years getting worse uh, as the years went on when they went from more moderate prime ministers to openly anti-Semitic or openly pro-Nazi uh, by the very end when Horthy was trying to cut a deal in the middle of uh, the autumn of 1944, as so the Red Army was losing. Uh, the Aero Cross Party, the Nazi-style party of Hungarian fascism, that movement helped overthrow him with Wehrmacht assistance, uh, and they went wild. And I, I, I go about some of that summary beforehand because uh, something that's maybe a bit strange for the Axis countries was that Admiral Horthy uh, apparently did not want to lead the charge with anti-Semitism, or at the very least his regime didn't lead the way with it. They tended to follow the dictates of what was demanded of them by their senior partners. And he supposedly, and the readings of many historians tried to keep the arrow cross at bay, uh, or not give in to their demands entirely. So this meant that the Hungarian Holocaust began a lot later than it might have in other Axis territory, uh, until his own authority was really falling apart. Uh, and Korn, I was born Janusz Kornhauser to a Jewish family in Budapest. And he changed his name after the war. And he describes his childhood in a well-to-do part of town. His father was an attorney who worked for a company that did business with German firms. And for years, he said they were sheltered from the worst of this, uh, in part because in their social circle, they were doing business with the Germans who didn't want to live in Germany anymore, if they were going to keep working, they moved to Budapest and other places in other regions and worked in their language in other cities or other countries in the region. And that he went to a school, uh, a gymnasium taught along German lines where he could tell these were people who didn't mention Nazism once, didn't have a crossword to say about Jews, and if anything, they sounded glad not to live in Germany. And in his family, where he was, I believe, the youngest of the siblings, um, his father was already well into his 40s when 
Corn I was born, or then Kornhauser was born. And he said he was really not only protected from politics, but that his father, who, had, who looked up to Germany, figured that this bizarre totalitarian <coughs> regime wouldn't last forever because this was Germany, the most civilized country on earth. They had so many achievements, of course we'll get back to normal with them at some point. And we all know, looking back from today, that that was not how the 1930s and 40s would turn out. Um, soon, the gymnasium that the young Janos was attending in a family of privilege uh, had to get rid of all of its Jewish students. And when he switched to a Hungarian school taught in Magyar by teachers who didn't hide their anti-Semitism, he could already feel the difference. Even if it was a soft difference, it wasn't immediate rounding up or deportation by the state, but ways that they could oppress you in slow motion. And this is something that repeats a lot throughout his autobiography. In the post-war communist years, and he, uh, even now beyond the pages of it, up to the Viktor Orban day today, where the current Prime Minister of Hungary for the last nine years has been able to shred a lot of Hungarian constitutional democracy uh, in slow motion. Uh, without any sudden grand gestures of terror on the order of what Kornai saw as a young man under fascism or what he saw in 1940s and 50s communist Hungary. But something palpable nonetheless. Um, I gave the outline earlier of the breakdown of the, the Axis Hungarian regime in the autumn of 1940 as the Red Army was coming in. And this is where it turns very tragic for a young Janos Kornai or Janos Kornhauser's family. His father is taken away to Auschwitz and is never seen again. One of his brothers did not die in the camps at the hands of the Germans, but died doing forced labor for the Hungarian army, digging trenches on one of the fronts. I believe he said the, the Yugoslav front. Um, he was able to hide out in various ways, including working as a bricklayer. And this is a very eye-opening experience for a young man who'd grown up in a lawyer's household, where they might have been the sort of fading, hated Jewish sub-bourgeoisie, uh, but where they had privileges that working class brickmakers and bricklayers did not have. And he had to hide out over that final several months sometimes sleeping in stables, sometimes sheltered for a night or two by a kind family, but most of them can't keep you for very long. They can keep you for a few days. And then it gets hot, you have to keep moving if you're hiding out, because there will be searches from time to time in most places. Uh, and this went on for Kornai and his contemporaries, who were lucky enough to survive. He has several harrowing stories that I because I'm trying to cover his whole life, won't be able to go into them all about that period. And I'll try and leave some time for this and other observations of, during Q&A. Uh, and he said at one point he was hiding out at uh, a Jesuit institution where they were on the roof and they could hear the gunshots down below as the Red Army was finally clearing out the city of the Nazis and the Arrow Cross. And he, uh, said, he also had stories about the difference between um, how they were treated at the hands of the Hungarian army, which maybe didn't relish in performing cruel acts for their own sake, versus at the hands of the, the fascist parties, the Arrow Cross or the Nazis themselves, who Yay. made it obvious that they wanted to perform cruelty right away, loudly and often. And he was lucky enough to survive the war in a destroyed city with a destroyed family. And after the war, when everything was ruined, he joined the communist movement. First as a sympathizer through its youth group, then later on as a party member. And he describes uh, what it's like to convert to the communist party in stages. 
um, as a sort of vague sympathizer all the way through wanting to join the party and beyond up to working full time as a professional paid activist. And he said a lot of this had to do with the number of different factors, uh, which are looking back on them, and he looks back on them as an ex-communist, and he tries to point out that this wasn't just like, well, once I was stupid and later I became smart, or once I was drawn to evil and then later on I was drawn to good. He maintains a very detached analytical tone in his look at a lot of things in life, or he at least attempts to balance that with what he knows are obvious emotional loyalties. He said the Hungarian communists, even though the Hungarian resistance was very small and very weak, they were one of the only parties that had been consistently anti-fascist, one of the only parties that had any sort of credentials in the resistance, skimpy as it was, that there was the fact that they did indeed feel saved by the Red Army, even if the Red Army he points out there were all kinds of petty thefts, the number of times that they just took his watch, or other abuses, there were rapes, many crimes that the Red Army committed during the immediate occupation of Hungary. But nonetheless, this, they had brought an end to the terrible regime they had been under, and the one that had begun exterminating his people in particular. He said that it was one of the only parties in Hungary, the, the foremost party in Hungary that did not judge Hungary's Jewish minority harshly, did not make it a penalty to be a Jew. And even though he was from a completely secular family, and didn't think of himself, didn't identify in many ways as a Jew, the experience of Holocaust era extermination attempts, anti-Semitism, the mass roundups, losing family members, all of it. The complete upending of his old life, but that was a major reason for saying, yes, this was the party that knew this was wrong. And to some extent, this is a pattern all over a lot of occupied Eastern Europe, not just for Jews, but for the appeal, more generally, of the Communist Party Thank you. to Gentiles in those lands as well. The only parties with any credibility, or the greatest credibility in the Communist resistance, in the anti-Nazi resistance, were often the Communist parties. This is all a little dry and bookish, so I'll try and keep us going. He also said a lot of it was because he was young. He had the energy to really give his heart over to a new cause and a new life as a young man. He had not even finished high school when the war had completely disrupted his life and the roundup of Hungary's Jews had even taken him away from the crummy anti-Semitic school to which he had to transfer. Um, or the school with some anti-Semitic elements in it. And he pursued a career as a reporter, an eager young reporter. He started covering things like the harvests. He started covering all manner of local news. And he said, looking back on it, most of his press clippings looked like propaganda from the early years. But by the mid-50s, he had noticed something had changed. Um, there had been a lot of squabbles over the first few years of Hungary's post-war history. So there was a coalition government, and does anyone know, maybe know some of these terms? Salami tactics? Has anyone ever heard that term? No. The leader of the communists was a man named Matthias Rakoshi, and he said that a coalition is like a piece of salami, and you slice off the other parties, and that's how you wind up with the communist dictatorship carve them off like pieces of meat. So they purged away the more moderate parties. And this is part of what will lead up to the Hungarian Revolution attempt in 1956. And there was some jockeying back and forth between the leader of the party, who was a very hardline Stalinist, uh, and, and those who had spent, like him, a large amount of time in exile in Russia while the party was illegal and others who had lived underground in Hungary during the interwar years and the wartime years, who had no interest in taking all of their orders from Russia because they'd already survived life in the underground. Or they had less interest, shall we say, in taking orders from Russia. And there were tensions back and forth like this also uh, in other Eastern European countries. 
Um, and there were purges because of these tensions. Um, the man who would later become Prime Minister of Hungary after the 1956 revolution was crushed, had already been imprisoned once during those years. The man who led the 1956 Hungarian revolution, Imre Naj, was imprisoned during those years and eventually brought back to power. But while the Rakoshi dictatorship was still in full flower and Stalin was alive, there was a spirit that they really were building progress, that they really were overcoming the destruction of wartime, they really were overcoming the horrible legacies of fascism and the backwardness that had dogged Eastern and Central Europe before that. There we go. Um, and there was hope in those times. And he started losing his hope when his own friends were starting to be subject to the terror. And he said at first people would be arrested and you would think, well, he really must be a spy. He really must be a saboteur. I mean, the party wouldn't lie to us. And then after Stalin died, there started to be more openness about this sort of thing, even just whispered openness. And he found out that his friends had been tortured for no real reason. I wasn't a spy. I had been as loyal a party member as you. And this would come up time and again. He also found out that they didn't want you reporting bad news in the newspapers. I know this is something we can identify with here from our various points of view. Um, and one of his early examples of this was rolling blackouts. There had been a, a series of power outages. They couldn't explain it, they couldn't control it, and they wouldn't let him report on it. And he knew that this was a bad sign. And at one point while working at this newspaper, he and a team of other idealistic young, he calls them the naive reformers, even demanded greater press freedom from one of the Communist Party meetings. They got purged. They said they were lucky back when Stalin was alive for this they might have been killed. Instead they all just got fired and reassigned other places. And he landed in the academy. He did not have a university education, but he was encouraged to study for a degree in economics, which was very strange being completely through uh, a national agency that gave out academic credentialing and not through a university system. So he did not have a conventional Western style instruction. And this was, and he did not have unconventional undergraduate university education at all. And it was over the course of uh, studying these economic issues that he produced his PhD, which became his first book that was finished just in time for the 1956 revolution to break out. It was called Over-Centralization. See if I can dig out a copy of it. My apologies was later translated into English. And he said it is thesis defense. These are often announced in the public, or were at that time, they would draw maybe 20 people. His drew 200, because there was such a hunger for people to discuss uh, the problems of excessive planning. And over the course of his career, excuse me, my apologies. He has written a series of these books tackling this problem uh, and we won't be able to go through all of them in any great detail. But he looked at the problem of centralization early on, even though he still considered himself a Marxist, even though he still considered himself willing to work broadly within the bounds of whatever socialism had to offer. And something else he talks about, how he was afraid of expressing ideas too forcefully, um, but that nonetheless he would lose faith in Marxism. Pardon me for a second. Like I said, I have not been feeling well lately. Probably too many layers wasn't helping me. All right. Oh, thanks, 
Gotcha. Right there next to the right, right there, right there next to the podium on the chair, right next to the, the chair. Podium. Yeah, right there. So, you can just all right. Wouldn't want to spill it. My apologies, folks. So there was a 1956 crisis in the autumn, and I know I will burn up our whole night if I try and keep narrating the political intrigues in any of these given moments. But it was one of the top communist leaders who was the most open to reform, uh, to partnering with opposition parties that had been outlawed or eliminated from the coalition in the 19 coalition government in the 1940s, to defy Moscow, to ask to leave the Warsaw Pact, that led to the Soviet invasion. This is all within a two-week span between uh, late October and early November of 1956. <laughs> Many of you, of course, remember this when it happened. Some of the rest of us didn't come along till later. Um, and the repression afterwards was intense, and the flow of refugees out of Hungary, just like after World War II or World War I, was immense. He said they did not close the border for a few days. They let people leave. And he chose not to leave. He thought many times about emigrating because of the censorship, because of the repression, because of the problems of living under the dictatorial communist state. But the, his family was there. His life was there. He had a couple family members who survived the war as well, including his mother and sister. And that he was not ready to simply run away. He would travel later and teach overseas and split time, but he never wanted to emigrate. And this is something that kept with him throughout, has kept with him throughout the rest of his life. Because he criticized centralized planning and said that centralized planning was incapable of coming up with the correct amounts of goods and services that would need to be provided in each sector of the economy, he could never figure out the prices for them. The, the individual enterprises in the different sectors of the, the Hungarian economy or any other planned communist economy, weren't receptive to or interactive with one another because they were all taking their marching orders from above. He kept researching this in different formats. Uh, on his own, but he was never allowed to teach. And at first, he was fired from his job uh, where he was studying economics go work at a textile factory, doing bookkeeping there. Well, this afforded him the opportunity to see how a communist factory ran in practice. So now he could track the shortages. Now he could track the problem with the central planning figures. He could accumulate more and more data on how these problems worked. And in the early 60s, to mid 60s, they started to loosen up some of the repression after the Hungarian uprising was crushed in 1956, where there had been very tight repression in the late 50s and early 60s. And he was given more freedoms to go back to the institute where he had once studied, to do more economic research but it was with a series of hurdles to jump through, like, well, he still couldn't have students. He could maybe do some research, but he couldn't publish it under his name. Um, and he did some interesting research that looked ahead to future developments, including some early experiments with computer modeling, which I thought were fascinating from the 1960s. And to give you some sense of scale, he said the computer calculations they did then would take a team of economists weeks to work through, even with their vacuum tube computers, which could now be done in seconds by a computer. But they tried to look at different 
ways a planned economy could work, depending on how if different decisions were taken at the center where they were doing the planning, or in different reactions or choices that the individual enterprises could make. Hire more people, get more raw materials, invest more in capital. And that you could use these computer projections to tease out the different developments. But he found this line of research very frustrating. He did it through the 60s and 70s. He said we could never get good enough computers to keep up with whatever they used in the West. And all we ended up proving was that it was very nigh on impossible for anyone to ever do centralized economic planning correctly. Because there'd always be missing information, targets would always be set too high. And he found this with other economic research he did over the course of the 60s. But this opened the door because he was working with an, uh, a mathematician uh, named Tomasz Liptak. This opened the door for them to get published in the West, where there were also Western economists looking at mathematical models and computerized modeling of different outcomes depending on different economic choices. And this allowed him to start getting published in Western countries more easily. And for the first time in the mid-1960s, start visiting them. And it was gradual. At first, to deliver a paper at a conference, then go home. Then being invited to give a series of lectures, and then go home. And then eventually, by the end of the 60s and early 70s, being given the privileges to how are we doing on time? All right, I'm running on a little long here. To, to go abroad and uh, even teach for a semester at a time as a visiting professor. And around the late 1960s, the Hungarian Communist Party decided, you know what? We're going to start doing some kind of pro-market reforms. Still within a one-party communist dictatorship, still within a predominantly planned economy, and they needed they needed people who knew what to do or had thought about this before. So they needed Janusz Kornai. They needed the man they wouldn't and others like him, a man they wouldn't let teach students at a university. But they needed his ideas, so he was allowed to go back and continue researching at the Institute in Budapest, where he had been dismissed years before, even by the same old boss, as if nothing had ever happened. He said, however, it was very hard to trust anyone anymore after something like this had happened. And in the course of writing his autobiography, as an older man, he was allowed to go through a secret police file and see just how many people had been spying on him because of access to his files, how many people he knew had been informing on him. And not just colleagues reporting private conversations in Budapest, but also people he met when he was traveling abroad reporting back to the Hungarian consulate or reporting back to the, their intelligence agencies. Had this conversation with Janusz Kornai last Tuesday. He described his attitudes towards Marxism thus. Uh, and whether or not they thought they could maybe someday groom him to be a spy, they ruled no. That he would not be good at bringing in information for them or recruiting new people for them in the field, but that they were afraid he might be working with someone else. They harassed an American economist who just wanted to study Hung the Hungarian economy and had the man's pa uh, passport or visa revoked, his visa rather, and kicked him out of the country because they figured, wow, oh, he's come to study the Hungarian economy with this Janos Kornai guy. He, this must be the crime of the century. It turned out to be nothing. And when he was researching this book and looking through the archives, how the secret, uh, how the, the person at the secret police archive said, like, oh yeah, we never did quite catch that guy, did we? As if this was something they were still thinking about 30 years, 35 years later. Um, and it was strange that they wanted his, his insights, but what they didn't really want to do, the Hungarian communist leadership, was loosen up the biggest parts of the economy that were state-controlled and outright really state-owned. The heavy industry, 
and some of the larger farming ventures. They could allow certain small things to develop, sort of like what's happened in China a little bit later. Farmers selling a little extra surplus, or a little bit of extra eggs that, that they could sell. But the, the heavy industries, which were around 70% or more of the economy that were directly owned by the, the, the state, were wildly inefficient, always running at budget shortfalls, always running out of materials. And this would become contagious. One piece of the economy couldn't get something. The other piece of the economy couldn't get it. You've got a shortage on steel. You have a shortage on textiles because they haven't brought you the cotton yet, so you can't even make textiles at the textile factory. And this is what he continued researching through the 70s. And he said he knew he'd lost his faith in Marxism. But he didn't have a safe way to express that if he opened up with the premise that I no longer believe in Marxism and I'm going to show why the premises of Marxist economics don't work. But if he framed his argument as, for whatever reason, we keep having shortages year after year, we keep having problems in central planning year after year, that he could tackle the problems that way and continue to get permission to publish. And he said he wasn't going to publish one set of things for the Hungarian audience and another for Western audiences, where it was all in the same language, uh, in uh, different versions. He wanted to have the same argument presented, first in Hungarian and then translated for other audiences, so that he didn't have to wear two faces if the secret police were always watching him. So he kept it technical. Don't argue with them about ideology. Don't argue with them about one party rule. Get back to the shortages. Get back to why the planning was a problem. Get back to why the targets of the planning couldn't be met. Get back to how the information didn't flow through the central planning agencies from one part of the economy to the other. And he published a series of books about this. Uh, the Economics of Shortage was very famous within academic circles. That came out around the end of the 70s. And he talked about how he developed it working increasingly on academic trips to the West, more for the peace of quiet than, it, than anything else, but also as he looked at the contrast between how Scandinavia or Western Europe or North America operate <coughs> compared to the Eastern Bloc. And he continued developing those ideas and he came up with the, the phrases, the economics of shortage, which I outlined somewhat earlier, and the soft budget constraint. Has anyone heard of this idea of the soft budget constraint? It sort of suggests itself in the name, the idea that if nothing can ever really go bankrupt, they can always ask the state for more money, or they can always ask other industries that are more profitable for money, that in these centrally planned enterprises, <laughs> that are directly owned by the state in the communist system. There was no way that any of them could ever really be told no. So what happened instead was that they always ran out of stuff. And the economic targets only existed on paper. And that you would have to know other ways, either through bribery or moonlighting or the gray economy or other networks of influence to be able to even get basic materials to help run a factory or finish a construction project, um, much less get consumer items. And he continued to advise the government in Hungary while also working in academic circles in the West from the 60s to the early 80s. And finally, in the mid-1980s, he was able to get a pretty interesting life splitting time between Budapest and Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he taught at half a salary each place for half a year. Well, researched in Budapest, wasn't really teaching until after the fall of communism there. And teaching at Harvard for a semester and going back and forth. And at that point, he was in his mid-50s. And the 
kept this arrangement going up until 2002 when he was in his 70s. He said this was a lot easier to do when he was in his mid-50s than it was when he was 74, 75 years old, and by then it was time for him to retire, at least from that part of his life. But this meant he was one foot in the east, one foot in the west throughout the final years of the Cold War. In the years leading up to the fall of communism and the immediate aftermath. <sighs> Sorry, folks. We have a little more water here. Uh, a less elegant presentation than I'd hoped. Um, and when it came up to the crisis in 1989, he published advice on reforms that should be taken to replace the communist system and make the transition to a market-based system. While he was writing his final, longest study of the socialist system, uh, in the sense of the you know, Soviet socialist system. And his advice differed from what was taken later. He has a lot of reflections in his book on how he didn't think the transition actually went very well in the change of system in Eastern Europe. Um, in part because he thought that the weakest public sector ventures probably in practice could not be eliminated very quickly. What they had to do was unchain the market sector in Hungary and let it grow fast so that people could buy and sell and start small businesses and start shops, start small enterprises, do more with their small farms, and that the, the largest ventures, well, no one was ready to buy them immediately. Uh, we couldn't keep propping them up the old-fashioned way under communism with the soft budget constraint where, now. Well, Maybe the steel mill never really works out, but we'll, we'll keep paying for it. There's the old joke under communism, uh, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. Any of you had heard that one? Okay. Um, but the, for the, that state-owned sector would have to coexist side by side for quite some time with the growing private sector. This wasn't really the advice that was ever taken, and he said he's had this problem many times in life which was why he remained largely an academic economist, much more so than a pundit or someone giving advice to politicians. He said ever since he'd been thrown out of the Communist Party, back before the uh, Hungarian uprising in the 50s, he couldn't really trust another political party again. He could trust trying to do his research and hopefully doing good research that would be of some use to the public conversation. And that he has never uh, answered the call from Hungarian governments to serve as a minister of finance or something, you know, some sort of governmental post in the years since the fall of communism because he's still wary of politicians and what they will do and not do. And he said he's nonetheless given advice to a number of post-communist politicians. and. Uh, that they tend to do what they want, whatever your advice is. And that's a real disappointment to think about someone with his skill, someone who had dedicated this many decades of work to this cause. Uh, it also meant he kept a lower profile, so he was not one of the dissidents of Eastern Europe uh, out there on the barricades in 1989 in that way like you might have seen with the Solidarity Movement in Poland or with Havel in Czechoslovakia. Uh, or he simply was not that, that was not the role he was playing as an academic researcher. But that he did what he could to contribute to an understanding of why central planning wasn't working, why state ownership being dominant over private ownership wasn't working. And he wasn't a purist or an absolutist about any of this. He looked at Western economics as something that he learned from the outside. So he wasn't party to any of the disputes between Keynesians 
and Friedmanites, for example. He was just glad that none of them were Stalinist and they were talking about actual things. He said that Keynes looked at the problem of unemployment in his most famous study. And that's why he was inspired by Keynes because he thought that if a market system has problems with cyclical unemployment, we have problems with chronic shortage. And this helped inspire how he looked at economics. It wasn't just direct inspiration from right-wingers, capitalists, libertarians in that way. And I know we're running a little long and okay. a little clumsily, so I'll try and tie it up soon. We still have about five or ten minutes, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get us to Q&A because I know that we may do better with that. <laughs> uh, he continues to publish, and you can read many of his articles online. I've read several of them recently. <laughs> and among his most recent reflections are two that I thought were pretty noteworthy. Uh, and they're somewhat related. One was about China, where he also advised them in the mid-1980s, in the years before the Tiananmen, after the reforms had started in their economy, but before the Tiananmen cracked down in 1989. He said that Hungary had been half-hearted in the changes that China made wholeheartedly uh, when the Communist Party was still in power in Hungary. That China marketized the economy very aggressively but maintained a very tight one-party rule. And looking back on it, it's entirely plausible that a place like Communist Hungary if they'd been, if they'd had the follow through that the Chinese Communist Party had, could have done things to invigorate their economy and keep themselves in power. Um, and he's glad that it didn't go that way exactly, but considering that in China they have a deeply entrenched dictatorship and a very powerful economy, he says he helped create a Frankenstein's monster. Was the title that he used in a piece from, I believe, earlier this year. Uh, or translated into English earlier this year. And he's been worried about what's happening in his own Hungary, where there has been, for the last nine years, Viktor Orban, leader of a party called Fides, which was a, an acronym for the Alliance of Young Democrats. He was a student activist against communism in the 1980s. He was a young prime minister of Hungary once earlier, between 1998 and 2002, where the after effects of a rapidly privatized, high unemployment uh, austerity years in Hungary had led to a lot of backlash but also the thorough discrediting of a lot of the major parties that had been there in the 1990s. And even though Orban had come out of a very different part of Hungarian politics 30 years ago, he absorbed a lot of the constituencies of and rhetoric of right-wing nationalist rural parties and has led a government for close to a decade now over multiple elections with a harsh right-wing populist tone, a lot of cronyism in business, severe harassment of opposition parties, severe harassment of the opposition press, a dominant ownership of the press by people who are allied with the regime or the ruling party. And this is not all necessarily exclusive to Viktor Orban or Fides. Um, there's another more extreme Hungarian party uh, called Jobbik, which is an openly neo-fascist party where they have the matching uniforms and the weird little flag, uh, preaching anti-Semitism. They've been uh, extremely harsh during the refugee crisis in Europe of the last few years, having put up a fence all around Hungary. And some of you might have heard about this. They passed a, a law that had some of the biggest demonstrations in post 
communist years and um, was nicknamed the slave law. A lot of the Eastern European countries lost an enormous number of people, especially young people, to emigration in the decades since the fall of communism. Hungary's total population has remained more or less flat. So the Orban governments have taken measures to try and counteract this. One of them is that they subsidize birth rates to good Hungarian families, quote unquote. And another is that they passed a law. Did any of you hear about this? So-called slave law. They have a labor shortage. They're anti-immigrant. A lot of their young people are emigrating. They're not drawing a lot of immigration in. And even if they were finally starting to have better productivity, better exports, uh, a better share in export markets, they were having a labor shortage. So they passed a law that they could make you work overtime and your boss might not have to pay you for three years. That's just one of its more onerous features. I think it's a bit beyond that, Charlie. But we can get to that in Q&A, um, which I promise to get to relatively soon. One full at a time, please. Yeah. No, no. We'll all, we'll all set a good example for each other, I'm sure. Um, and one of the more, one of the academic posts that Mr. Cornei has had in recent years is at the Central European University. Has anyone heard of this place? It's a school funded by George Soros, who is a hung, another Hungarian Holocaust survivor. It was based in Budapest until it had to move to Vienna. It was founded in the aftermath of communism, like a number of schools that Soros and others, other philanthropists helped encourage all over the former communist bloc that were in favor of constitutional democracy. Uh, Viktor Orban did not go after the school because it was pro-capitalist. He said that were, one of the things he raises the problem is that they had a gender studies department. And he also uses, in a, used in his last political campaign, George Soros and uh, Juncker from the European Union as the two boogeymen campaign posters were just a vote against these two guys, George Soros and Jean-Claude Juncker. And at their farewell graduation ceremony, uh, or no, I guess this was, wasn't this last spring, this was the 2018 ceremony, my apologies. Cornei was given the Open Society Award at Central European University, saying that ideas do not have to apply for visas. And this attempt to expel pro-democratic university from Hungary was contrary to what we know here at the playground for people who think, which is that ideas are international, transferable, freely debated, and freely exchanged, even if you don't all think that way about economics. Um, and I would emphasize before I close and go to Q&A, that I have been feeling quite under the weather for the last week, so please forgive me for not having a clearer presentation in mind. Oh, good. Um, Very good. And uh, if this is something that gets more interesting, I can try and revisit with greater polish going through any of his individual books or writings. And I will open it up to question and answer. If, I don't know if one of you would like to be a moderator or an immoderator. Would you be willing to help moderate? If one of the... We don't want any of the socialist operations. Actually, in the spirit of bonhomie and unity, I would be honored if one of the left-wingers would like to come up here and be my moderator, just so we know that it's all fair. <laughs> one, of the, one of the progressives? No? You got a question? Yeah. Okay, uh, Tim, no. Oh, I know, no camera. Okay, we'll, we'll keep it honest. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I came from former Soviet Union. Yes, ma'am. From Russia. <laughs> so my question, my question, you know, see, like in Russia, we really, we studied history about uh, Hungaria, Austro-Hungaria, Austro Austria, Germany, blah, blah, blah. But now I learning from you, which is very good thing. So tell me two, two questions. Okay, very quick. 
first, this guy who you talking about, he now in America or he is in Hungary? He has been in Budapest uh, full time for almost all of his life, including since retiring from his Harvard post in 2002. Yeah. So back in Budapest again. Yeah. He splits his time because his kids live overseas to some extent, but he's been based in Budapest for 17 years now. So he did like again, uh, full time again for the last uh, 17 years. Okay, and my very next question very quick. So can you tell me, I don't understand, like Czechoslovakia also close to Russia, right? Yes. How come Hungaria, uh, maybe because they're close to Austria, and Austria and Germany was very close, like a Nazi talking about. So how come Hungary more violent and more pro-Germans than Poland or Czechoslovakia? How come? And I find that so many anti-Semitic uh, Hungarian people more than Czechoslovakian or uh, or Poland, Polish people. So how come? Which special everything close borders? You know, that close. That's what my question. How come Hungary more violent and more pro-Nazi? How come? Or then Czechoslovakian, Poland, and Russia. Thank you. I, I will try to do this well. Uh, some of that. When we're saying we're pro-German, at least in the immediate aftermath of World War One and leading up to World War II, if we look at those three Central European countries, Poland, the former Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, um, I think there's a, a, some of it is there's a little bit different dynamic in each of those countries. For example, The interwar government in Poland for much of that time, which was new, you know, these, and these were all, we should emphasize, newly established or re-established countries 100 years ago that had been, you know, four empires that dominated most of Eastern Europe with a couple of independent states tossed around in there, but that, you know, Poland had been split between the Russian Empire, the German Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire was only newly united in 1918, 1919, fighting border wars around the same time that the Russian Civil War was going on. So Poland had direct conflicts over the Danzig Corridor, the Gdansk Corridor, with Germany that would help leave them on the opposite side of disputes with German nationalism in the years between 1919 and leading up to World War II in 1939. Czechoslovakia was exceptional in Eastern Europe in those years. It's the only one that was a stable constitutional democracy under Tomasz Masaryk and Edward Benesch. Even, you remember, even like uh, in 1968, Russia yeah. sort of like invaded Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And even then, Czechoslovakia was never uh, aggressive towards to Russia or towards the European country. How come Hungary is so aggressive? Well. I don't know if it was in part the 1919 Hungarian Soviets was part of the legacy, but also it was the way that the regime broke down. Uh, there's a good book on this by a man named Gregor Eckert, uh, The State Against Society, a comparative study of Hungary 1956, Czechoslovakia 1968, and then the Solidarity Movement in Poland. The Hungarian state had broken down more thoroughly because the Rakoshi government had been that much more repressive. The Prague Spring had not, it came after the crushing of the Hungarian uprising, so the Prague Spring was already not trying to be, they were trying not to be as risky with their reforms. Uh, the way that Imre Naj was willing for about a week or two to entertain the possibility of leaving um, the Warsaw Pact and leaving the communist world behind. The Prague Spring uh, under Dubček never really tempted that fate. And then by the time you get to the Solidarity Movement in Poland, it's a bit different because it's coming completely outside the Communist Party from different institutions and Polish civil society allying themselves together. And I know we've got a lot of eager people here, so I'm going to try and get to the next one. Thank How about this guy next? Conrad, young sir. Um, I have a short question. Um, what was the slave law that so, within the last year, uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, passed 
a law that was called the slave law by its critics um, that said that this is in part because it was a labor shortage. There weren't enough people to fill the jobs in Hungary because a lot of the young people leave when they reach work age after they finish school. And because they, this is in my view of things, because they don't encourage much immigration. They've tried to encourage some immigration of older white people who will move to the country to live in picturesque farm towns when they retire, but they're not bringing young people in to work in the cities. And they're not eager to have people from outside Europe like the refugees who come from the Middle East or from Africa uh, to do any of the entry-level jobs uh, because of the anti-immigrant politics that this man has been encouraging. But because they had this labor shortage, they passed a law that said bosses could require people to work several extra hours per week and would not have to pay them any time for this, these extra hours within the next few years which is kind of like giving people a massive pay cut. Well, it is giving people a massive pay cut for the hours that they work by all of a sudden increasing the number of hours they work by, you know, 10, 20 hours a week, something like that. That's and then not paying them for years, if at all, for any of the extra hours they work. All right. mm, I don't think on that scale, but all you're next. All you don't know what you're talking about. All right. Well, uh, yeah, that's why we have a rebuttal What's period. your question? All right, Charlie. We've never had anything quite like that law, which they protested against. We uh, have no one enforcing labor laws on overtime. But that's another topic. It is another topic. I tell, 25 years, I can tell you a swore, swore story. <coughs> but Save it for the rebuttal. Oh, yeah. Just the economists, you talk there about plant economies <coughs> not functioning. What about in, in capitalist countries? The operations are full from operating flawlessly. There's bankruptcies, layoffs. Shutdowns. People show up to work and yes. laid off instantly. Bankruptcies. There isn't a company that lasted more than a couple What's the years. question? You're making too much sense, Charlie. You well, don't. You didn't counter. So you don't. Well, I, no. I, 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 with you. Have, you have raised a, a worthwhile question, and I will answer it to the best of my abilities. Cornei talks about how, because for the bulk of his career from the 1950s until he retired in 2002. He was an expert on Eastern Europe, an expert on the Soviet bloc, and how planned Leninist economies, or Stalinist economies, or post-Stalinist, however you would term them, operate. Uh, he does not exonerate how capitalist economies function, but because he wasn't a general interest pundit in a Western country like the United States. He spent half his time here. But he wrote for academic audiences, and he wasn't going on talk radio talking up a bunch of trash. Now, since his retirement, uh, he still publishes some. He has, he's continued to publish from his mid-70s to his early 90s, somewhat less often. And one of the papers I really liked, and I'm sorry I didn't do this justice when I was giving the presentation, was when he revisited his idea of the soft budget constraint. Um, because one of the things he was talking about, this was after the worldwide recession, uh, he said, we now see that the soft budget constraint operates in all kinds of places other than just a centrally planned economy. <laughs> We've seen it happen with Wall Street and international investment banking. Another place he's talked about the soft budget constraint, and this is where he doesn't fall into an obvious ideological camp like liber or, or, or a narrow intellectual sect like just libertarian or just Keynesian or you know just rational choice theory or just neoclassical. Um, the soft budget principle he's seen um, in he was looking at the healthcare sector specifically how hospitals operate, and his conclusion was that no society has yet figured out how to deal with soft budget constraints in healthcare. Not socialist societies, not capitalist societies. And he goes on to say, it, it is, there's been no modern country that has been able to do anything 
where they pretended that there's not a government role for health care, which is not a pure libertarian view in any sense. That is a very you know mixed economy view. The main part of his argument, though, to, to tie it back to what he observed through the years of the Iron Curtain, was that when 60 or 70 or 80 percent of your economy is directly state-owned, centrally planned industries that chronically run at a loss, the shortages are pervasive and widespread. No. All bullshit. You're crazy, Charlie. Well, what about the time, dude? It's the, 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 it's the, no, it's, a, it's the, I mean, it's the shortages. It's the, the goods not being available. It's the East German store without stuff on the shelves. I mean, it's a different issue than stuff on the shelves, but not enough people can afford them. What's that? What happened to the Depression? You ever heard of the Depression? Yes, I've heard of the depression. We can get to his, we'll, I wasn't giving a presentation on the Great Depression. Go on. Man. We'll go George. I'm not your dad and I'm not your domestic partner. I mean, I don't know what you're looking for here. We'll go George and then Dave. Right. Why did Russia gain so much from the Yalta Agreement? They gained all the Eastern Europe. What kind of agreement was that? And, and East Berlin? Uh, well, the shortest answer is that... that the Red Army did a lot more, had a lot more people that were fighting a lot more of the Wehrmacht. So they were doing a lot more of the fighting in Eastern Europe. There are many competing explanations given that I'm probably not qualified to weigh in on all of them, ranging from how weak was Franklin Roosevelt at the time to just the fact that the Red Army dominated in the field, beating the Wehrmacht, pushing the Wehrmacht back to Germany, and sweeping through Eastern Europe in the process. And some of it was politicking between Churchill and, and Stalin uh, over whom would have influence where. S there's also another historian who said, uh, Melvin Leffler, that Truman uh, was so scared of Stalin that he gave him more leeway to consolidate the dictatorships in the first two or three years after the war than Stalin originally anticipated he even would have had. Sorry if I was getting too loud back there. No, that's okay. Yeah. It's, 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 it's... We'll go Dave, uh, and then the show. Uh, excuse me, but yes, uh, isn't saying you don't know what you're talking about the same as a personal attack? I mean, I'm not a theologian either, but we, it, could, it could be. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll go this gentleman and then uh, Keith. All right. When you had all the people fleeing Hungary, mostly younger people, were most of them going to Germany? They've gone all over the European Union zone since Hungary's membership. I don't have a good breakdown in front of me of which country and which relative numbers, but to the more prosperous countries and within the EU. And when they flee to the more prosperous countries, that is because of capitalism. Because they have me, they're able then to ha make a living in these countries, especially in a Germany working for the in the firms, giving you the jobs that their system cannot supply. Well, I, I, you're on to something, but remember that, that they're, it's the post-communist Hungary that's having this problem and. Yeah, I mean, the EU has a, it's, they're going to the more prosperous economies in Europe, by and large. Uh, Germany is the economic, it was called the economic miracle. But they're not fleeing communist Hungary anymore because it's been, they're moving back. It, it's, it's been a different vibe now. N now they've paid off a fair amount of their old national debt, but they have this strange mixture of the labor shortage and the government that's starting to shred constitutional freedoms. Uh, we don't know exactly where this is all going to lead, which is part of what's so unsettling about it. It sounds like it's a government that's always shredded freedoms. Oh, yeah. Well, the, they, during, I mean, a lot of the, the story in a lot of Eastern European countries was, and this is part of what I find so distressing, that, that okay, maybe Poland, the Czech Republic and Hungary would be the most hopeful three. Their economies weathered the, the storm of the transition better. They had more of a leg up on establishing multi-party democracy. They accepted the change to a free press more readily. They didn't 
descend into some of the problems that you saw either further south with war in the Balkans or further east where there was much more elevated levels of corruption um, or in some of the former Soviet republics dictatorships that never went away. So watching the erosion of constitutional democracy and what had been the hopeful cases, you know, one of the most hopeful cases in Hungary, of like, oh, this is the country that's going to succeed in integrating with the rest of Europe, um, is at least one of the things that has struck me. And incidentally, because of the economic reforms that they had tinkered with back in the 60s through the 80s, another one of the nicknames they had was that they were supposed to be the happiest of all the barracks in the camp of socialism. Uh, that they had a softer life living, you know, a little with a little bit less censorship, a little bit less venom under goulash communism. I'll keep it moving for more Q&A, because I know we have a queue of people waiting. Uh, we don't have prisons in the United States. Charlie, let's wait one pull at a time, please. Uh, I'm Go ahead. not vindicating whatever you think I'm vindicating, Charlie. We have no prisons. Really interesting speech, uh, well, we Adam, and I apologize if this was in stated in the introduction and I missed it, but so, how did you hear about so? this individual? And what, what piqued your interest <laughs> about him? Uh, I had flubbed giving that in the introduction. I first read Janusz Kornai about 20 years ago when I was in college. Uh, I had a course on politics in Eastern Europe, and it was one of the professors in that course who introduced us to his work. Actually, it was the more left-wing guy um, who considered himself more of a Marxist sympathizer who introduced us to Kornai's ideas about soft budget constraints and the economics of shortage. Um, and it was through... Now, I, that was one of many authors I read in this course on political and social change in Eastern Europe at a pretty left-wing college in Ohio, whose name shall remain unstated. <laughs> I'm kidding, it was Oberlin, it's a nice place. Um, and Professor Crowley and Professor Vujicic, thank you both for the instruction you gave me in that wonderful course. Um, and it, it came up again as I continued to take courses with both of them, uh, looking at the post-communist transition in Russia, which was a horror show, uh, and that was just after the ruble melted down and just before Putin was anyone had heard of in the Western countries because he hadn't been appointed prime minister. Uh, and with the sociology professor, other courses about political sociology, about Marxist movements and Marxist ideology, along with some of my other work uh, that I was studying back then, um, I couldn't get enough of both of these guys these two professors who helped lead me to Janusz Kornai. But he was one of many names that I hadn't encountered since college, had not thought about much since college. And you'll be surprised when I point out who it was that helped pique my interest again in Janusz Kornai. It was that man in the hat in the back row who's been heckling me a little bit because it was coming to the College of Complexes that I thought about I wonder if they heard about the economics of shortage or the soft budget constraints, because this isn't think tank ideological literature. This was just a guy who was trying to figure out for years, is there a way we could just get our, we could actually do a little bit better with our economic performance in Hungary? And when I found out that he'd written his autobiography, which is called By Force of Thought, Irregular Memoirs of an Intellectual Journey, I thought, oh, I have to read this guy's life story. And I ended up being captivated by his life story, even if I uh, didn't sculpt it very well tonight. No. Uh, and because he wasn't someone writing for mass audiences um, in political magazines, much less on TV, not in this country. I think he, he's known maybe as a bit of a pundit in Hungary, he said people recognize him on the street because he's interviewed 
on their TV shows. But I mean, that's a country of about 10 million people, bigger fish in a smaller pond. So it was, <coughs> learned about him in college. My interest uh, was re-stimulated in looking up his ideas again in my discussions here. And because he, yeah, like I said, been a citizen of a communist country and worked within a communist country, tearing his hair out, trying to figure out how they were going to make ends meet, economically speaking, uh, as a society, that he was coming at it from a different angle than someone who could just be accused of, like, ah, you, you were just coming into this debate because, you know, you're biased or because you're bourgeois or, or something like that. Uh, you know, he based it all off the math instead of just the philosophical intuition. Um, even if I didn't get down any charts or do any PowerPoint. Um, I, I hope that's enough. I don't know if we, we may have more in, yeah. more yes. inquiries. Okay. Let's go with uh, this you, gentleman and then Andy. All right. Okay, first off, I found your remarks very interesting. You raised some legitimate criticisms of socialism. Socialism has to be adapted to each country's conditions. And maybe they do a very good job. But in your opinion, who is the, so the source of the most misery around the world since World War II? Who has, Martin Luther King, he made the comment that the U.S. is the source of more misery around the world than any country in history. But what's your opinion? Since WW2, who's responsible for the most violations of human rights? The most, I'll just use the word misery because I think it covers everything. <laughs> And if you want me to name, I think it's the U.S. And if you want me to name examples, I will. And you talk about these Is there a countries. question mark? Well, uh, you got Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. They're right here in the U.S.'s backyard. And the U.S. had to take responsibility, backing coups, backing fascist governments. There's a question here. But who yeah. has caused the most yeah. misery since yeah. World War II? Misery. Um, that's not something, in, in the way that I look at history, and look at politics, even though I know I've been identified. You know, by the way, none of the remarks tonight are tied to my role as a member of the Libertarian Party, nor do they represent the you know, views of the Libertarian Party as such. Um, because this, this guy didn't come from that pool of thinkers. <laughs> he didn't come from that pool. But I, I don't hand out um, blue ribbons for single worst offender, necessarily. I think I will say that the Cold War in general was the source of an, imme an immense amount of misery. Um, for myself, I could make the case for why I prefer the United States to the Soviet system, but I in no way uh, diminish or deny, and I can discuss at some great length if you want me to, that for all of the quote-unquote good things I can say about America's foreign policy role, America's role as an empire around the world comes with an enormous amount of blood, heartache, hardship, innocent victims, uh, societies that have suffered immense damage at the United States' hands, and where, because we're the, the country that won the Cold War, we're also left looking scarier as the, the, as the one that was still standing and as the one that still has uh, the power in the years since 1991. Or at least say from 1991 up to the Great Recession. Now I think we're entering a more multipolar world where it's not the one superpower versus another superpower and their respective allies, like we had in the Cold War. And it's not the 20 year moment or so where the United States was paramount and no other great power in the world was of any size. I think we're watching in good ways and bad. If there was anything that you treasure about America's role with Wilsonian pretensions, or the pretensions of collective security, those are on their way out. We're not going to see their like again, because there's no consensus anymore, if there ever even was, amongst the Western democracies. 
if, despite that, if there was even a consensus, if that was just a fig leaf for what used to be the British Empire and then became the American Empire, if that's kind of the argument you would make, uh, point taken. Uh, but we're, we are in a world now where I think the United States Empire may soon be as much of a memory as the British Empire was. And it'll be the Chinese Empire, whatever sphere of influence Putin's Russia and his successors carve out for themselves over there. Regional strongmen like Erdogan's Turkey. I think we're looking, in, uh, we're looking at a future where, for various reasons, the, the unipolar moment, as I've heard it called, I think Charles Krauthammer called it that, and other foreign policy observers, not just the late Krauthammer, as a pundit for the Washington Post. I think we're seeing that pass. Um, and in terms of total number of bodies versus most places covered on the map, it might be the People's Republic of China that killed the most people. The United States might have hit more points on the compass. Well, they're, they're painting on a bigger canvas because they've got the largest population on Earth. Um, I don't know if that, that satisfies you. I hope. I'm satisfied just about China, but I thought you gave me a very good answer. All right, okay. let's go with uh, Andy, uh, and then we'll go for another, I'll, I'll ask a question, and then we'll go for another round. We should be getting to rebuttals after the next two. Yeah, they're going to want to hit me back. I'll give them uh, just a okay. counter. And we got... I have a question. Uh, you, you right have mentioned that you might uh, uh, tie some of it together with uh, recent events or what's happening in the world now. My question to you is, out of all your studies and the body of knowledge you have amassed studying this man and others like him, apparently, how does that knowledge help us deal with problems today? You know, how, can you point us in the right direction? How can we use uh, you know, your knowledge and presentation? Yes. How does that apply to solving current problems today? I'll try and make it, uh, I'll try and make that three quick points. I was inspired that he's still taking a stand at his age against populism because I was pleasantly surprised uh, to find out that he was A, still active, and B, opposing Viktor Orban. Because far too many people have been, uh, especially people associated with being pro-capitalist, pro-free market in one school or another, have said, ah, Viktor Orban's fine, or he's not that big of a deal and that this man was willing to say, no, this right-wing populist backlash is really threatening uh, to the norms of constitutional democracy. Even if it's only halfway to dictatorship or midway to dictatorship, midway is too far. Any far is too far. Two, the soft budget constraint and the economics of shortage as giving not hard and fast, uh, not pure, free market principles for how to live life, but that if you're going, whatever part of your economy or your social service sector that you decide, this we have to have, even if it's going to run at a loss, that means that the rest of your economy has to be able to pay for it. Uh, didn't mean to get too loud there, sorry. That you have to have a, most of your economy not running with soft budget constraints in order to pay for, for example, if it, let's say it's hospitals. If you, if you have to pay for people's health care, no matter what, and if you think that the public has to pick up the tab, no matter what, then health care has to run that way, but your average steel mill or coal mine can't, you know, or any old textile factory can't, or any old farm can't, because not everything can always go bankrupt all the time, or you won't be able to pay for those things that are really vital. Is that... All right. I want to ask a question. Uh, I, think I'm, I think I might have asked this to you, but I forgot. Sure. Uh, uh, he, you said that he had um, renounced Marxism and found problems with centralization. Even despite all that, did he still consider himself a <coughs> socialist or a, or at least, you know, like a pure kind of social or you know, benign socialist? I guess. Uh, not exactly. Well, not all. He did not change all at once. He talked about going from his, uh, a naive reformer when he was still a, ref, a uh, reporter at Shabbat Nebuch, 
uh, Free People, I think, the newspaper where he was working in the 40s and 50s. And in the early years after he written his dissertation over centralization and economic administration, uh, that he was hoping they could maybe just improve central planning, but he was he no longer considered himself a Marxist. Um, okay. Have a good night, folks. Uh, and then he uh, was still willing to work within the system into the 70s, but by that point figured it was really coming apart. Uh, however, he had kind words about um, one of the places he wrote the economics of shortage, he was working in Sweden at the time. And he had this great story about how working in Sweden and also teaching in the United States during part of Watergate, a very eye-opening uh, for two different reasons. In Sweden, there was a socialist party there, different kind of socialist party, different kind of system, social democratic mixed system. He didn't have a nasty thing to say about Sweden and like, oh, you know, he didn't have some criticism of Swedish social democracy, but he said, he was there in 1976, I believe, when the Social Democrats lost an election. He said they'd been in power 10 years longer than the Hungarian communists did, had been in power, and, and they handed over power after losing the election like it was no problem. No one was put in jail, they didn't sh shut down opposition newspapers, they didn't declare martial law, it was just... Okay. Ordinary life. Uh, I'm sorry. Wrap no. it up. Is that what you said? Basically, yeah, because it's starting to get to be like. Uh, maybe sorry, we'll folks. take one more question, yeah, but we got to. All right, it. one more uh, question. I, I heard that George Soros got kicked out of Hungary. They don't want him in there. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, it would be my contention that that the they don't want him there could be more because they've whipped up a frenzy a against him. What you say? They were already, they meaning in this case Fidesz, the governing party or go, led by Viktor Orban, was already going after him before the 2015 refugee crisis because Central European University has been there for almost 30 years or well, they, they are now in Vienna because they had to leave. <laughs> but because they were advocating on behalf of constitutional democracy, not some... It, it, this problem did not start just after the mass refugee crisis or over Soros having a more generous view of immigration, by far, <laughs> than the Hungarian nationalist government has. Um, so I think it's... And this is a mistake that we've heard repeated a lot. Um, that it was only, you know, only when Soros was in favor of refugees that all of a sudden they had to get rid of him. They've also been whipping up a lot of anti-Semitism, uh, a revival of anti-Semitism in the governing party and also in this party to the right of it, the Yogic Party. And at the last elections between the two of them, Fidesz and their junior coalition partner, got almost 50% of the vote. And because it's a parliamentary system, the way that the districts are drawn and they're divided up, they get over two-thirds of the seats on just under 50% of the vote. And the second largest party with about 20% of the vote is Jobbik, which is the neo-fascist party where they have the creepy uniforms and are openly anti-Semitic and openly anti-Roma and openly <coughs> racist. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, I know we're... Right. Shortage economy on time. Skip, you want to ask the last... You want to ask no, the last? I'm, just, I'm just simply saying... Uh, Let's thank our speaker for a very well informed. Yeah, yeah very good. Very, very good. All thank right, bro. Well, I did that. <laughs> How many want to speak and rebut tonight? <laughs> who's uh, who's uh, giving rebuttal this evening? We'll go about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven folks. I think about three or four minutes. Four, four minutes. All right, we'll go four minutes. Get up and let's start speaking, please. Who wants to go first? Gene, uh, we'll, we'll get Gene up there and let him go. Are you keeping count, Andy? Yeah. Okay. Four minutes apiece. A great presentation. Uh, it makes me think of Daniel Immerware. Uh, how to hide an empire if you generally believe in the American system. 
but you're not saying the United States is the greatest country in the world every way and every day. So again, I thank the speaker of great presentation. Oh. All right, I'll go. All right. I'm going to go early tonight. I've never been this early in the, in the rotation. And anyhow, let's thank our speaker again, really. Yeah. I know he did a lot of reading preparation. Take it very seriously. We appreciate it. We'd like you to come back again when you got another topic in you. I'll be brief uh, regarding overtime. I've had extensive experience. Uh, to give you some stories, we had one agency in the government uh, with 20,000 employees, and we actually kept doing one department at a time. And you put in overtime claims for violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act. So finally, I said, why don't we do the entire agency? And we contacted each employee nationwide, and every single employee had performed unpaid time uh, and was owed money. And there was a nationwide cash settlement of thousands of dollars for each employee. I could tell you war story upon war story. Notoriously, employment in the United States, people work more hours here on unpaid time than in any other country on earth. And have less vacation time, don't use it, things like sick leave, time off like that. The stories and statistics are incredible. Uh, you gave us a thing about, basically about, well-planned economies don't work. However, this gentleman lived uh, adjacent to the, in the Soviet Union. And in 1929, first they had a new economic policy under Lenin, but in, under Stalin, and they implemented something called the five-year plan, a planned economy. And you say, well, there were shortages, it didn't work, it didn't work. Now I was at corn, I didn't notice by any chance. In that, during their first five-year plan in the Soviet Union, iron and steel production increased, this is incredible, by an amount of 400%, unequaled anywhere in the history of economics, I believe. Amazingly enough, the production of oil, petroleum during the five-year period, increased an amazing 800%. To say that planned economies aren't possible or flawed versus what the chaos that goes on in capitalism. I have, where's Timmy? I can't have that data here where there's a recession or depression every 10 or 20 years since this nation was founded, established in 1789. The chaos that goes on, unemployment, shutdowns, closures. It's like the college complexes, they closed the restaurant overnight. Told the, no one didn't know about it, we didn't know about it. Things like that are endemic to capitalism. To tell me that a planned economy doesn't work. Well, I've got my data, perhaps, and you've got yours. But that's what I was thinking. They planned economies, by the way, were continued it, through 1965. They enabled the Soviet Union to defeat uh, the German invasions. That iron and steel production made the tanks, the T-34 tanks, and the shells, and the ammunition, because the Soviet Union, Russia, defeated Germany. Everyone acknowledges that. And it was that, the industry of the five-year plans, that enabled that to take place. That they were invaded by an army of three million German soldiers, the top-notch army on earth. And they defeated them through the industry, industry of a planned economy. Last of all, I don't know what this guy's got a problem with, with health care. He lived in the United States. There are 100 million people who either were underinsured or had no health insurance at all. And this guy talks about, well, there's some problem in plan, every planned economy that I've read about, and I've been, believe you me, I've been debating this topic, socialized medicine, since I was in high school, that is the solution. Tell me that there's some problem in socialized medicine versus the problem of 100 million people with no health insurance in the United States whatsoever. Zero, zip, nothing. And to have some discomfort, of socialized medicine, believe you, I assure you, it's simply a net something I can, that I can deal with. But when it comes to no health care whatsoever, 
That's it. Anyhow, thank you very much. Come again when you got another one. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Yeah. Next rebutter, please. All right, you can give it to me. I'll take it. But you did all right. Our next you show rebutter. promise. No, no, no. <laughs> I think uh, Adam did a really good speech tonight. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I, I do like how uh, the, uh, Mr. Cornei, uh, you know, the, his observations didn't come from. Uh, you know, uh, a purely free market oh, yeah. anchor, and I, I think that that uh, his observations uh, may, you know, make it give more credence to the critiques of planned economies. Um, I, I think it's really unfortunate, also, that many people uh, on the American left fetishize uh, and. Um, uh, I guess I'll just use fetishize. Uh, people like uh, Stalin and uh, authoritarian figures, um, you know, it's, 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 if somebody were to say they support Nazism, it's very, you know, it's evil. It killed a lot of people. You should be ostracized if you think that we should revive that sort of ideology. Likewise, uh, anybody with the, you know, after witnessing the bloodbath that was the 20th century, I think the same sort of ostracism should be applied to folks who want to revive Soviet-style communism uh, and whatnot. Um, so if it's okay to punch Nazis, then it's okay to punch communists. Metaphorically, uh, non-violently speaking. Who's talking economics, not human rights. Uh, yeah, I mean, communism has been horrible on, on human rights. Uh, I mean, look at, look at China, look at uh, the gulags in Russia, um, look at the killing fields in Cambodia. Oh yeah, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie probably thinks it's uh, propaganda. He probably, he probably has a huge... One uh, floor at a time. I should say uh, hard on for probably folks like Paul Pot, uh, and that's unfortunate. And, and I, I wish people who had these sort of sympathies could uh, be ostracized from society like a Nazi would. Thank you. Nothing at that. Go ahead, David. Completely off topic. The bottles do tend to go off topic. Zero. With regard to the comments that were made about how it was the five-year plans and so on that enabled the Soviets to beat the Germans. Now, there is some truth in that. And it's true that Russia shed more, shed more blood than anybody else during World War II. But much of the work that was done to keep the Soviets fighting was done through American Lend-Lease and through the supplies that we, gave, that we gave them in the interest of defeating our common enemy. And the idea that the Germans were the top-notch army, uh-uh, at the beginning maybe, who do you think defeated the Germans? Well, we did. No. I would say that we wound up with the top-notch army during the Second World War. Particularly when you consider that we defeated not only the Germans, but the Japanese as well. And I would also say the following, and some of you have heard me tell this joke before. But it's become, if I may say so, a classic. There was a conference in Moscow many years ago, and somebody stood up during question time and said, Comrade Chairman, what is the difference between capitalism and communism? We've heard this three times. That's right. You're going to hear it again, Charlie. Every week. And, One full at a time, please. And the. Uh, Chairman said, Comrade, that's a good question. That's a very important question. I'm glad you asked it. Under capitalism, man exploits man. Under communism, it's the other way around. All right, you can talk about Stalin. <clears throat> and uh, others, and not without merit. But I want to tell you, when people start talking about Pol Pot, that's where I draw the line. 
I don't want to hear anybody saying anything against Pol Pot. <laughs> Pol Pot, anyone with the word pot in his name can't be all bad. I said, Dave, you naughty man. Well, the guy he, about he, it's kind of it's kind of interesting, Charlie. The Berlin Wall fell in 1989, but communism didn't. 100 years after the Bolshevik Revolution. One fifth of the world's population still lives under the single party communist regimes in China, Cuba, <laughs> Laos, North Vietnam, I'm sorry, North Korea, and Vietnam. From the famous purges and gulags of Soviet Union to Mao's great leap forward in the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge, communists have killed more than 100 million people over the past century. Countless smokes will suffer still. And you think the United States is to blame for most of the world's problems? I think not. Remember, it was capitalism that brought down the Berlin Wall. It was the free markets that liberated mankind. And it was and still is world trade that's going to bring the rest of the world out of abject poverty. It is time to put this communist ideology and socialist rhetoric into the ash heap of history. And it is time to teach these children of ours what the true source is. Under capitalism, yes, there are bankruptcies, there are layoffs, there are people who are fired. There are firms that go out of business. Every day. But you also have to recognize the other side of capitalism. The constant innovation, the newness of jobs, the creation of new wealth, the constant dyna dyna dynamicism that it results from a capitalistic economy. So don't tell me that Communism works. Yes, you want to keep your workers protected. Yes, I do acknowledge some need for government programs, for some safety nets, but not at the expense of saying the rest of the world gets poor. We don't want authoritarian regimes. We want multilateral party democracies that preserve the legacies of the people. And we don't want this constant trend towards authoritarianism that we're starting to see the world trend towards. No, I am for communism. I am for capitalism. I am for freedom. And yes, whether I like it or not, I really like the words of Milton Friedman, that economic freedom goes in paramount with political freedom. And Charlie, you can shove it up your blankety blank if you think that socialism and communism are going to save the planet because obviously they have not. When you look upon the ash heap of history, it is always those capitalistic regimes that have prospered and brought more people out of poverty than any of your socialistic clap trap. Yeah. Amen, brother. Amen. Can I I hope it's not considered a personal attack if I say there are a few prostitutes here for Wall Street. I mean, I don't think I could say there are spokespeople for Wall Street. I have to use the word prostitute. And to say Paul Pot is indicative or an example of a socialist would be to say that Adolf Hitler is an example of your everyday capitalist. I don't believe Paul Pot was a socialist. He was a power-hungry monster. And I don't believe the people in North Korea are socialists. Again, it's a power-hungry dynasty. But, you know, I, I, I enjoy being around spokespeople from Wall Street because, let's face it, they're running out of ideas, and I like when they come up with new ones. All right. Not real socialism. <laughs> not, not real socialism. Not. 
not. How do you want it to fight socialism? <coughs> Who else we got? Socialism puts the working class in charge. Uh, Socialism puts the working class in charge. Who here supports suffrage for everybody, pretty much? All adults. Who, who supports strong labor unions? Who supports, you know, uh, safe work environments and, and stuff like that? Uh, you, support, you support labor, uh, what you mentioned, labor? Who supports, uh, I don't know, basically these are the planks of the fascist uh, manifesto, so all you guys are fascists. Wall Street has you in their back pocket. Really? Yeah. Which, where, how do you know that? I heard some Wall Street executive went through airport security and when he was told to empty his pocket, Hillary Clinton came out. Hey, ooh. I'm a capitalist, or I'm, no, I'm a no, Wall I'm Street. Just saying, he's corporate. Well, Democrat. you said I was a Wall Street guy. Yeah, you know uh, what? Guy. You're a spokesperson for Wall Street. Hillary is a Am corporate I? Democrat. Biden's a corporate Democrat. Am I? Reagan was against unions. I'm. Am I? Yeah. You're, you're just a spokesperson. Yeah. You're, you're, Who's paying you're, me? You're on the bottom. <laughs> Who's paying me? So why are you taking their side? Yeah, Who's paying me? In light of all these horrible well, things they've done, sending idiot. people off to die in nonsense wars. Wall Street did that? Them. Who on Wall Street, Wall Street, Street did that? Wall Street benefited from it, and now you're a spokesperson for it. Why do you support union? Why? Right. Hey. I support union. No, it's he not. doesn't support yeah. union. Me too. I don't support union. Excuse me. What? He doesn't support union. When did I say that. She said you said that. When did I say that? I'm not support union either, okay? Who, when did I say that? Support unions? I'm not support union. Well, who said that I said that I did it? Because that say? didn't happen. Did That's I not true. experience, you know, with union, they were very bad. Well, I never said anything about being anti union. And I am a proud team. <laughs> <laughs> she can understand stuff. She just doesn't say it. Well, she can understand stuff. She just doesn't say it. Because that's what happens here. She's heard a lot of college complexes videos. Union? Because they smart. Yeah, and they make, that's why they make three dollars an hour. No, Boy, that's Shari, smart. They, have they don't even work a full week. Some <laughs> some <laughs> they're smart. Charlie, some job. What's stupid? You know? No. Good evening. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, Andy. Anybody hear me back here? Everybody here okay? Barely. Uh, barely. All right. Wait, turn up a little bit. A little yeah. bit, yeah. See if uh, I don't shout into the mic like some others. <coughs> I got slain. Hello, hello. Testing, testing. Is that better? That's better. You hear that? That better back the there? The capitalists yeah. are losing this whole argument. What? The capitalists are losing. <laughs> For those of you that might be concerned about. Um, Capitalism versus socialism versus all the other isms. There's an article on Common Dreams yesterday that said human activity is not responsible for destroying the environment. Profit driven capitalism is. If you don't, I, I re again refer you to a book published 20 years ago. Uh, John Mc Professor John McMurtry from Canada published a book called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And he said, if you don't regulate capitalist sharks, if you let these people get bigger and bigger and become multi-billionaires, they will just get huge like sharks and mindless sharks and eat everything in sight and destroy a country. And that's what we're seeing is fossil fuel executives say, well, we're sorry that the kids may have no future beyond 2050, but we need our billions now. The, the billionaire predators that own our pharmaceutical companies, by their actions, they tell us, I'm sorry your child is dying because you can't afford $30,000 a month in medicine, but I need my billions. Uh, it's nothing personal against little Johnny, but we need our billions. Uh, when you have no ethics, morals, and conscience, and you're allowed to run wild as a billionaire, there's a huge amount of damage that happens, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, America is in the final stages as, uh, well, America is the premier example of billionaires gone wild in a capitalist system. No other country in the world, no other modern country in the world permits 
a company like a, uh, an insurance company to employ people to deny health claims until the person dies. Then have, right after that person dies needing an operation, they approve it. That's what's going on in America. And it's young people talking about, for those of you that don't know because of the slander in the media, the, the so-called Green New Deal is not uh, something green about the environment per se. It's a new deal for economics, <coughs> health care, like, uh, like the, uh, it's his friend, uh, Roosevelt, in, in, in the 30s, Roosevelt proposed a new deal, and he made a deal with the capitalists, basically the billionaires. He said, we won't prosecute you for treason for trying to overthrow the government if you will stand aside and let us implement these social programs that will help people. We had Social Security started. We, we had uh, universal education coming out of World War II, the GI Bill, uh, all kinds of things that aren't socialist at all. They're what you need uh, to run a country with fairness, justice. If you look at the, the current rankings of the best places to live in the world, they're not communist countries, they're not socialist either. They're what's called democratic socialist societies. That's Sweden, Switzerland, <coughs> Norway, Finland, uh, the Icelandic countries. Sure, they, those people have more disposable income than we do with lower taxes. The reason for that is their taxes are a little higher than the taxes they pay, but universal health care is free. Education is free all the way through college, basically. These things are, you know, they don't have homeless people in Norway. They consider that a disgrace to have anybody living on the street. They first provide a place for them to live and then start looking at helping them through their health problems and everything else. So we've been brainwashed in this country over the last 50, 60 years thinking that our unregulated capitalism is the best form on the planet. And incidentally, there's groups of veterans all over the country that are working with General Butler's book, War is a Racket. War, these, the war we're in right now, the current war of the Middle East, <coughs> we're, you know, the only place we're hunting for terrorists is in oil-rich countries. And uh, Butler said, if you sell to the military, clothes, shoes, whatever it is, you sell to the military in peacetime, you make a good 10 or 12 percent profit. If you sell those same things to the military in wartime, you make 100, 200, 500 percent profit. The big corporations use our military in so-called war on terror to prop up the profits for the corporations just want to make and sell stuff. That's what's going on and we're reaching the end of the line. And if you listen to some of the speeches from some of the 20-somethings that are in the worldwide green movement of uh, Extinction Rebellion, climate change. Uh, you, they give you a clear understanding of what's happening and what, what we need to do for the future. So there's, there's good things happening all, all over the place. Is everybody familiar with the fact that solar energy in Illinois now, solar electricity is cheaper than getting it from ComEd? Nobody, nobody's heard that. That's because the Illinois press is blacking that out. Are they really? Yes. Were you in the, were you, were you in the room where they said they were going to black it out? A no, black, no. a blackout. I'll, I'll address that issue because it's one of a person living in an artificial bubble of ignorance. Yeah. Uh, we, <laughs> Fox, Fox News. There's. It's not a personal attack. We have kind, decent people, just like there were tons of kind, decent people in, in Catholic churches. Half the population knew, knew that the priest was abusing the kids. The other half didn't know. It, mean, it, it doesn't mean that the people that support the priest are evil. It's because they, doesn't know, they don't know he's abusing the kids. That's what you don't know that there's blackouts because you're living in a bubble of a blackout. That's what we're talking about. I, I, come to one of my talks on censored news, and you'll see how, how the media runs coordinated blackouts. It's a fact of life. University, uh, colleges all over the country are teaching students now how not to get fired and blackballed if you're going to be a journalist. 
because you can't talk about certain things that cut into the profits of the gas company, the electric company. Now, ComEd is beginning to promote solar, even though they want to be the Illinois tollway of the, the electric lines. ComEd is positioning themselves to charge a toll for everybody that's using the lines coming and going. Well, it is but theirs. Rooftop solar and the big solar farms produce electricity now cheaper than ComEd's electricity from the nukes. And for those of you that didn't hear about it in the news, cities across the country, starting in California and on the East Coast, in Massachusetts and Vermont, they are municipalities are passing laws making it illegal for a gas company to run gas into a new home. For new construction, gas pipes are illegal. You won't have gas furnaces anymore because solar is cheaper, solar and wind are cheaper, and they're not polluting. We got to stop burning fossil fuel. That's the bottom line. So, um, Volvo is going all electric next year. Mercedes is running commercials on television with electric cars. We we don't see any of this hardly in the press about the beneficial technology that's yeah. going to get us off of fossil fuel. So, I'll uh, talk more about it next week or the week after. After the student season is over, after April 17th, I'll give a talk here on the best of the green new equipment, probably right after Earth Day. I'll debate Dennis, you on that. Dennis should talk about it on Earth Day. Dennis Nelson will give an Earth Day presentation. About I want to debate him on the Green New Deal. You it's want to debate, uh, the, debate the pros and cons of the Green New Deal? Yes. Why well, would we you have debate? all three. Huh? <coughs> okay. Well... We can have three twenty minutes. That's kind of like debating whether the Earth is flat or round. The database on one side is enormous, and it's not. Yeah, not it's on my side. Anymore. So. Um, it's on my we'll side. Talk about it in the future. Um, is there any other uh, any other rebuttals before we wrap it up tonight? All right. Let's have okay, a couple like more up say. here, please. Oh, yes, right. okay. Please, you have got four minutes. Up. All right. If you will so uh, <laughs> well. Thanks, Eddie. Sure. My name's Peggy Balling. I am the mother of this uh, uh, speaker for tonight. And I just wanted to chime in with a couple of observations I made after moving from rural Nebraska to the big city to Chicago in 1971. And I, I worked exclusively in hospitals uh, until I retired. I worked with a, a Noah's Ark of people from all over the world. A good number of them were from uh, from the Central and Eastern European countries. That was their lineage, if not their direct uh, their direct homeland. And on pretty much a monthly basis, I knew people, f women from Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Ukraine. Lithuania, some uh, Russians, who would put together boxes of things to ship back to their family members uh, who were still uh, living in Europe and were doing uh, <coughs> without. And they would always include the most pathetically meager things to the American mind for their, for their cousins, for their, their uh, their, their cousins who, who were uh, their age or a little older, or a little younger, particularly the girls, and bragging about how much steel can be made by Stalin over an increment of time, when in decade after decade after decade, these girls were shipping over to their cousins tampons, band-aids, aspirin, the most basic consumer items, made of course by social, by, by non-socialist, by capitalist countries, things that the capitalists just didn't care enough to provide for uh, the least of their brothers, the ones and sisters, the ones that they did not care enough about to provide the very uh, most, the, the very most basic things that, that uh, made a life even borderline comfortable. I gotta tell you, I never heard this in college. I never heard this, uh, I didn't go to the library to read about it, but it was an education that I got from watching the people who had a little something 
to share what they had with the people who were getting by on almost nothing. And it was a profound education for me as to what, once you get the scales moving and in balance, made the most sense as far as what worked for those cousins of theirs, those aunts, those uh, nieces, uh, those grandmothers, those grandfathers who were, who were just doing without. And I was shocked after all the um, rhetoric of the, the 50s and the 60s when I was getting educated about what communism was threatening America with, I finally realized how communism was threatening the people that they controlled. They'd cut them off with almost nothing. And I, I was stunned and it changed my whole outlook on what we owe to our brothers and our sisters, what we owe to this thing that we call planet Earth and all the people on it, and who are the people who are more likely to give a little more, to do a little more, to help a little more. That's Thank you. Thank you. Hey, can I say something? Yes. Thanks for coming here. Um, can, I, can I say something? All right. You know, I'm glad there's no homeless people in this country. I mean, man, that would really be a disgrace if there were hundreds of thousands and maybe over a million homeless people in this country. That would be such a disgrace. So one thing I'll say for the U.S. is there's no people living in homeless camps. And, and, and we and I'm also glad that we didn't have a legalized apartheid in this country. It wasn't just a cultural thing. It was legalized apartheid. I'm going to quit being funny. How can you refuse to look at our problems here? I agree. There were a lot of problems building socialism. I understand that. But your hatred of socialism shouldn't make you blind to our own problems here. Who's blind? You're, you're, you're All Mr. right, Walsh. I just want to comment here. One thing, uh, I mentioned they, they started out, they had a new country, a revolution. They, they fought a revolution for a few years. They started a new country and they had a new plan. And they were going to produce iron and steel. And the reason they chose to do that was because they knew that they were going to be invaded. And the, yes, in the second five-year plan, there are many discussions about domestic goods. They certainly knew about refrigerators and not washing machines. And the imminent uh, threat of war was foremost in their minds. We have not lived in a country that's been invaded. They were entirely correct. It was, a, it was the best thing they ever did. Did it deter their getting domestic goods? Most assuredly. Poor countries are poor countries. I know about the Eastern European, I'm Lithuanian. They didn't see the things like aspirins and stuff like that. But what they did have, they, they shared. And they're, well, countries of Earth don't have the same economy. But they, they as a matter of fact, it's, it's a neat discussion today. And I know this is for the fact. Like he's talking about young people moving around. Uh, as we're running a Lithuanian underground, the Lithuanians aren't coming to the States because things have improved back home. But they were certainly fully aware, but, and they were entirely correct. It saved the nation from enslavement by the Third Reich. And to say that they, they should have produced watching machines instead of T-34 tanks was, is, I'm sorry, not a policy. And to say that that's why planning, as a matter of fact, it's an example of how planning works. They knew there was an imminent threat, and it did come, and they were ready for it. That's what you want intelligent people in charge to do, to do the right thing. Not talking about, not talking about little supplies from the grocery store. This is life-threatening invasion. You couldn't get a sanitary napkin out of Moscow. said we couldn't even make pantyhose. It's shooting people. Do you know what? They lost 40 to 60 million people. They were acting. Come to town, burn it down, and shoot everyone. This is not playing pinochle. 
Because this is not when did that happen in the 70s and the 80s? <laughs> you know, and they were devastated. Do you know what room there was? Do you know what they had to come back from when you come home? And your house is, what, a piece of earth? Don't you know what happened over there? Do you do. think it was like pinochle game? We do know what happened come over on. there, Charlie. And it's they better had a than you do, Charlie. And you're dead know. wrong. There were even people that did that. They, they said this is the Marshall nation. Plan did okay. more to develop Europe no, than they communism did. ever Marshall did. Plan had nothing to do. That was nothing but capitalism. That's and right. And it brought it back like, Europe. That was a welfare yeah. 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 The wealth in this country, the wealth in this country, is founded on the back of the genocide of Native Americans and slavery. Without the genocide of Native Americans and slavery. This country would never we have achieved the wealth. It's been there. built on their back. And guess what? Yeah. We solved those problems. The Civil Rights Act. We well, had the Civil War that ended slavery to the tune me. of whatever. It, but the problem uh, right. already been made. Guys, Order, let's let time, Dave please. speak. Excuse me, please. I'd like to have my turn. Yeah. Oh. Considering Charlie had two, and this gentleman here is had two. Uh, I merely want to quote <clears throat> what Winston Churchill said, that the uh, greatest indictment of capitalism is the unequal distribution of wealth, and that the greatest indictment of communism is, is its uh, equal distribution of misery. <laughs> All right. Last, last. All right. Uh, I, if you guys haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend the movie The Death of Stalin. It's uh, it's got uh, Steve Buscemi as Khrushchev, and he's like tasked with planning Stalin's funeral. And it's a comedy, and it's like a very farcical comedy, and it talks about how. It shows how uh, horrible Stalin was and how brainwashed people are in these regimes and how they're, uh, they, they aren't afraid to speak up because they're afraid they're going to get stabbed in the back or disappear or whatever. So uh, I highly recommend The Death of Stalin. What if somebody... I saw Peter Pan too. One fool at a time. Fantasy. <laughs> Stalin, the only guy that can oppose communism, right? Uh, he had one of the He's higher... the only one. Huh? He's the only one, right? He's the only one that did what? That, that can walk around with communism. He's All right. Right? Well, I no, know. but I mean, I'm just talking about a movie I saw. But I mean, he's pretty, he's high up there. I mean, I mean, a lot of, uh, I remember Che Guevara had a picture of Stalin on his wall, you know, like as like a rock poster. So, I mean. What if we have American communism, American type of communism? We uh, like we like uh, like the Communist Party USA that we have American, here in Chicago. All right, all right, all right. All right. All right. They are all like Democrats point, now, so we don't have to do Russian communism. We can do our own. We can design our own. Without the CPU, How would it be any no different? No workman's comp. No workman's comp. There's no The CP buffer, Social Security, unemployment benefits, workman's comp. Minimum wage. The party led the fight for all of that. Roosevelt signed. Are you saying bill. we live in a communist country? No, the party led the fight for all. The in reforms, Chapter Two of the Communist the Manifesto, there's the planks or the steps that you have to take to be a socialist country. We have, and America's pretty much for. done all those. All so I'd say America yeah, is communist right now. The bill. Roosevelt signed the bill. Per the, the Communist Manifesto, the America is communist, okay. I would say. Have you ever been on unemployment? Have you ever collected unemployment insurance? Never. One fall at a time. Never collected All unemployment right. insurance. Okay. I didn't go to shut. public schools, I, but I had okay. no choice in that. I'm going to declare order. Let's we'll give our speaker the final He's word like and thank him again for coming. <laughs> we appreciate the spirited debate tonight, but it is getting a little out of hand. All right, one, let's let our fight. Let's let our speaker have the final word, Charlie. Here I was afraid I was going to put everyone to sleep. <laughs> I actually was afraid I was going to put everyone to sleep, or there would be an altercation, or both, and I might have actually achieved both of those trick shots tonight uh, in the first half and then later. 
Um, thank you all for coming. I, again, uh, regret that I had but one life to give for this presentation. Uh, and that it wasn't maybe better organized or polished. Uh, however, I would like to respond to uh, some of the observations, if I can go around those who remain here. Uh, Charlie, you have the most, so I'll try and save them for last. Uh, 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 let's, let's... Andy, I just wanted to uh, let you know that it might not be well advertised, but I know that I switched over, uh, my, my wife and I, together, and now our lovely daughter, used the um, energy suppliers for ComEdison that use uh, green... Yeah, and solar, yeah, the Spark Energy and Just Energy. They have two rival firms with which they've subcontracted that are the old, only ones that help with that. And it was, I'm not arguing for this purpose purely ideologically one way or the other, but it was the decentralizing of the electron, electricity business that allowed me to make that choice. Um, it is also, I believe, illegal for most of us, especially in the city, to get our power from off the grid. So we're not empowered, forgive the pun, to just convert our homes willy-nilly when we live in a densely populated metropolitan area. Uh, there's a degree to which the infrastructure, and I don't just mean the roads, but the social arrangements, a sort of social infrastructure, become um, almost unconscious and self-perpetuating with some of the patterns for how we behave. And Cornine talks about that in some of his other research from the 60s and 70s. Um, and also for General Butler's book uh, from the, the, the 30s, War is a Racket. Um, the Smedley Butler case is interesting, but I think it also bears pointing out not, it's not to deny that there are war profiteers who make money off of war, but I don't think it's just the people who, you know, sell chewing gum at inflated prices for soldiers to chew when they're in the battlefield that are the principal reason driving why major powers, especially, get into wars. And I'm going to cite two thinkers that are a little outside of this. Because Cornei did not look much at war and international relations, in part because, again, he didn't want to, for most of his career, didn't want to tip the apple cart um, doing his research in Hungary and not being able to even teach students while doing it. Although eventually he got to mentor some of the, his research staff um, in the late 60s up to the end. Um, both Raymond Aron, uh, who was a scholar of international relations and a French pundit who died in the early 80s, um, and a different European historian named Heinz Gollweitzer, I believe was his last name, wrote about some misconceptions about European imperialism. Aron talked about the outbreak of World War I, and he said, well, if World War I is because these capitalist empires only wanted each other's colonies and each other's markets, that was a fallacy, because Germany and Britain before 1914 were trading war with each other even though they put up a bunch of trade barriers with each other between the 1890s and, and 1914. It was worth more to the major European empires before the outbreak of World War I to keep trading with each other, even with their trade barriers, than for whatever they were going to get from colonial Africa or Southeast Asia or the Pacific Islands. In a word, it was uneconomical for them to go to war with each other over imperialism. Not that they, there's a different sector of people who are associated with the politics of imperialism. And one of the examples was the bank, the um, Baghdad Express that the German Empire had to, banks didn't want to fund that in Germany. They said, this is terrible. We'd make more money laying more miles of track. I know you're a trains person, Charlie. Here in Europe, where we're already doing business, more miles of track in Germany, more miles of track between Germany and other neighboring countries. It's only the Kaiserreich that imposed the political will and direction to build projects like that German Empire. And they had to marshal the cartels to do it amongst the heavy industries. And they had to marshal the finance to do it with the sort of state dominance. And I need to 
wrap it up. Tim is giving me the sign. We got uh, less than two minutes before we have to have so a th So then I better make it all Charlie. Um, the five-year plan was, I, I will grant you, important for the 30s, and because of the uh, game, I use this phrase, the Game of Thrones that was ongoing in Europe after the fall of the old empires, after the Communist Revolution, the Russian Civil War, and the Macht Geifung of the Nazis in Germany, you're right, there is a certain just imperative for the people of Russia to survive by rearming. But there was a cost to the five-year plan, even in the quote-unquote successful phase. And that was in the, the forced labor of pushing people out of the agricultural sector and into the industrial sector and the lost lives and lost harvests that came with that. It wasn't just a shortage of a little bit of beans on the shelf in the grocery store or something like that. This was massive, multi-million persons, you know, of death and upheaval that came in that. But it's also worth pointing out a very different point about that sort of emergency phase that you can justify for Soviet rearmament. Thank you, Tim. Um, versus later. There's a saying that maybe you've heard another one of those jokes that's often passed around about communism that they created the most developed 19th century industrial economy that the 20th century had ever seen. <laughs> what was hot news for 1929 or 1934 was not so hot in 1960 or 70 or 80 or 90 um, and wasn't so effective anymore and was, was actually worse to have outdated industry than to not be able to get rid of it. Um, there's also a an observation I've heard both from independent citizens, or former citizens of the communist countries, Gen Xers, people my age, and a few younger, not too many younger than me who remember it, uh, and also from political scientist Ken Jowett, retired from UC Berkeley, who said that this notion that communism was always fearful is a bit of a misconception, because by its later years it was weak and often rock. So we can, I think we all need to be, with my mocking t-shirt, you know, in there, uh, considerate of the different historical contexts, the different moments in communist history, uh, different things that would have drawn people to this movement or that. I emphasized using the word communist more than socialist tonight because I didn't want to play any dirty games about like, oh, see, Bernie Sanders is the same as Joe Stalin. Um, Kornai mostly uses the word socialist in his books because his argument is, these countries all call themselves socialist. They thought of communism, and Sid Cohn talks about this whenever he's here. Communism is that thing that happens at the end of time, once you've uprighted all the injustices in the world. Socialism was what those parties called themselves transitionally. To Cornei's view, not as some sort of um, avatar of Western banking, Scandinavian social democracy and the Western welfare states in general are a variation on the theme of capitalism or, or mixed economies. The thing that he's more worried about now is mixed democratic and authoritarian governance, like in Hungary, like we're seeing all over uh, the democratically elected countries. And I know they're one in the vacuum, so I better cut it off. Sorry for running on so long. Charlie, I hope you had a good time. Andy, I hope you did too. Viva la Reagan Revolution! Viva la Reagan Revolution! Viva la Reagan Revolution! Thank you. I'm coming tonight. I'm going to see it next week. Yes, it is. I am. Viva the new frontier. All right. Thank you for coming. All right. I don't have any comments.